and welcome everybody. Uh, I am real happy today to introduce um, the IMBLF network to Deirdre Nero. Deirdre is an immigration practitioner in um, Coral Gables, Florida, and her practice focuses on all types of business immigration, including employment-based immigration and um, non-immigrant temporary visa applications and related, related matters. Um, she works closely with small and medium companies and individual clients to coordinate and execute all aspects of their immigration strategy and represents them before the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Labor, and the Department of State. So we're looking forward to um, learning more about uh, Deirdre's practice and about the current state of immigration law. And with that, I turn it over to you, Deirdre. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, like Larry said, I'm Deirdre De Niro. I'm in the Miami chapter of IMBLF and actually joined during um, COVID life. So I haven't met hardly anyone in person um, <laughs> from the chapter yet, um, unless I already knew them uh, beforehand. So I'm really looking forward for us to start uh, meeting each other in person again and hopefully um, meeting some of you guys at some of the future IMBLF um, events. That's going to be great. So today we're going to talk about basically what you see here on the screen. And it's going to be more of just like new kind of interesting things that have been happening, um, kind of recapping what we just went through with the four years of the Trump administration and their policies, um, specifically as it relates to immigration. Um, what's going on with the new administration? What, what have they already done? What are they talking about doing um, in terms of immigration again? Uh, what has the impact of this pandemic been on immigration, which is, it's been substantial. I mean, as you could imagine, immigration is, you know, it's the movement of people um, across country borders. And um, this pandemic has really thrown a monkey wrench into uh, that process. So we'll talk about that a bit. Um, going in a little bit of a different direction. This is for my, my Florida people out there. Um, Florida's new mandatory E-Verify law that just started in um, January of this year. Um, and then related to that, uh, but not limited to Florida, we'll talk about some I-9 compliance updates, um, specifically as it relates to the COVID uh, flexibilities and, and um, things that employers uh, can do during the pandemic um, when they're verifying their employees that maybe they're not able to do during normal life. Uh, we'll touch quickly on the H-1B visa lottery because it's a timely uh, topic. It, it just happened, um, like, just now. It just ended, basically. Uh, so we'll talk about that and recap where we're at with that. Um, someone, it might have been you, Larry, asked me to talk about the export control compliance as it relates to immigration petition. Not really a new topic, but I threw it in there because uh, someone asked me to, so I figured why not. And then we'll review a few other little kind of hot and, and new topics. So that's where we're going um, over the course of the next hour. Let's jump right in. Um, so <laughs> my fellow immigration lawyers uh, know the pain. We had, a, we had a hard four years. It was a lot of... Um, as you can see on the screen, lack of transparency um, from the, the prior admin administration, an overall kind of hostility towards immigrants just in general that then trickled down through all the policy and, and regulations um, made by, by that former administration, uh, including just things like shifting away from like USCIS being a customer service based organization um, taking, you know, words out of their mission statement that, you know, used to have it focused on customer service towards um, foreign nationals and um, adding the word alien uh, where it didn't appear uh, before, which now the new administration is trying to move the word alien from, <laughs> from um, the laws and put in or national or non-citizen. Um, so little, even just little things like that, that, um, contributed just towards the general feeling of hostility towards immigrants. Um, I'm sure you recall the former president's uh, in some of his speeches, you know, just basically implying that 
immigrants were criminals and, and drug dealers and, you know, bad hombres, I think he called, called a lot of them. So, you know, that trickled down through the attitudes um, in adjudications uh, and in the policies. Um, we had 400 plus policy changes. Um, it seems like there was something new happening every week. Um, the immigration lawyers, all our heads were exploding on basically a weekly basis as there was some new change that that would come out sometimes usually on like a Friday night, right? So it's like, oh, thanks for ruining our weekends. Like here comes something on a Friday that we all have to deal with, um, you know, over the weekend and, and trying to figure out how that's going to affect our clients. We had a lot of bans. It started out right away with the Muslim. Um, I remember watching the news and, and, and crying at the news because I was so dismayed at what was happening. And I, I remember my boyfriend saying to me, you know, you don't really have that clientele, like where we live in Miami, you know, I don't have a lot of um, clients that were even affected by that. And I tried to explain to him, like, re regardless of that, like, it, just what that meant, you know, just the, the, what that implied and like the, what it meant um, was really kind of disturbing to, to immigrant advocates who basically spend our careers, you know, advocating for our foreign national clients and their interests. Um, and then the bans as COVID kind of came into, into play, there were bans on immigrant visas, non-immigrant visas, country related bans. We're going to talk about all that in a minute. Um, and it really was very difficult to deal with um, severe restriction on um, what we were able to do prior prior to these bans. Um, we also had a lot of delay, you know, like things just slowed to almost a near halt. It, it seemed, it felt like at times things were came to a complete halt. Um, case processing, you know, times for adjudications just doubling and tripling from where they were in, prior. Um, and we're still kind of feeling the fallout from that. Um, you know, we're going to need a lot of time to fix this. This is not, um, you know, we're, we're happy that the new administration is in and trying to fix some of this, but this is not something that can be reversed overnight. Um, can't change 400 changes at the drop of a hat. And just also the overall attitude kind of of the of the adjudicators and stuff. So it, it's a deep seated problem that festered over the four years of the prior administration. And now we're seeing slowly that um, things are gonna hopefully start to get better, but we're gonna need time. And we're seeing the continued kind of fallout from the delays and the increases of requests for additional evidence, a lot of times frivolous um, requests and putting our clients kind of in um, really difficult positions. And um, as advocates, it's been hard. So, you know, taking a deep breath and stepping back from all of that kind of terribleness over the last four years in terms of immigration, at least, uh, we saw, you know, a, a new day coming with the election of, of Biden. And, you know, a lot of people have been really excited about what's gonna happen, but, also, we're seeing, you know, um, over the course of the first hundred days that we're that we're almost um, we're almost, I guess, at that point uh, right now. Not quite, I don't think. I'm, I'm really bad at math, but I don't think we've quite hit the the first hundred days yet. But we're in we're in it, and um, it's it's been slow, but we definitely see movement in the right direction. Um, something we've seen is the introduction of. Um, they were calling it like Biden's bill, but you know, obviously it's a bill that was um, basically embodying what Biden um, announced as his immigration priorities. So you, you see that here. Um, we have in February introduction of the US Citizenship Act of 2021 in the house. Um, I don't believe it's been introduced yet in the Senate. It was supposed to be introduced at the end of February, um, but from what I, you know, I'm seeing, I don't think it was yet um, introduced in the Senate. I could be wrong, though, so um, someone call me out if, if I'm wrong. But basically, it's an identical bill to the House bill. 
Um, we do think it's probably going to pass the house. Um, it's going to be, I think Menendez said this himself when I heard him on a, on a conference with, uh, with an immigration organization that he was speaking to. I think the words he used were a Herculean task to get this through the Senate. So <laughs> we'll see, um, you know, how it plays out, but you know, they, they're, they're cautiously optimistic, but I think it's going to be a difficult um, thing to get, to get this bill through, through the Senate. Um, however, you know, we see that the priorities um, that, you know, are embodied in this bill, which you see here on the screen, are, are all really steps in a positive direction. Um, providing pathways to citizenship, strengthening labor protections, you know, keeping families together, diversity, protecting refugees, um, protecting workers from ex exploitation, um, prioritizing smarter border controls, addressing the root cause of migration. These are all really important um, themes that have, you know, long been kind of plaguing the immigration system. So uh, we're really hopeful that we get passed maybe in one bill, maybe we'll get some smaller um, positive legislation that, that comes out from this. So stay tuned. Um, and on that note, you know, like I was implying, Biden's first 100 days, these are the things, some of the things that he has done in the first 100 days already. Um, AILA, which is the immigration, uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association, it's our kind of voluntary bar for immigration lawyers has been an awesome resource. I'm not trying to sell them or anything, but they have really great resources. And one of them that I found that is super cool is this table of substantive changes that is tracking every single thing that is changing um, throughout the new administration. So if you go on there and it's actually like clickable, so you can click through um, the, the table and scroll through and it's really um, an interesting resource um, for for anyone that wants to see everything that that's changing and how and when. Um, so these are just some of the things that we have so far. Um, a big one down here in South Florida, TPS for Venezuela. I'll talk about that a little later in the presentation, but that's been huge. Um, we have a huge Venezuelan community down here in, in Florida. So um, this has been kind of like the real hot topic down here. Um, the immigrant visa ban, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, was revoked. Um, the Trump administration had tried to make the citizenship test much more difficult. Um, and the Biden administration said, um, no, strike that. We're going to revert back to the, the prior test, how it was before. Um, I think that's supposed to say 2008, by the way, not 2003, uh, for the civics test bullet point there. Uh, they you, were trying... Can I interrupt with a question? Just yeah, please. Someone who doesn't doesn't do immigration law, uh, what is TPS? And oh, uh, sorry, I forgot. Yep. forget that. Like the lingo uh, that we use, not not everyone acronyms are. There's a lot of acronyms too in in immigration law. So TPS is temporary protected status. So it provides um, a temporary protection and ability to get a work permit and a travel permit and some legal status for people that are in the United States um, as of the date that the country is designated. And usually it's countries that are like in the midst of, you know, right after a natural disaster or some kind of political strife or have like a some kind of really bad situation in their country. And it's a temporary designation that only lasts for a certain period of time. So if you see like the first bullet point um, one of the things that Biden administration just did was extended the designation for Syria because it was about to expire. And so instead of letting it expire and then putting all of the people that are relying on that protection in, in a bad situation where their protections are terminated, they extended. Also started a new designation for Venezuela that we never had before. So it's like a huge deal for, for the Venezuelan community down here. Um, They've done a lot of really interesting things like right away. So um, the ones that are more towards the bottom, some of them happened like pretty much first day, first week of, of the Biden administration, like ending the, the Muslim travel ban that I think was first day 
Um, one that they kind of always do, but has kind of special context for, for the immigration lawyers is the regulatory freeze, where basically they look back on like all the regulations that were basically in process before um, they, they came in with the new administration and they freeze everything for a, a review. And then apart from that, he also ordered a top to bottom review of all of the regulations, policies, guidances that were creating um, barriers in the immigration system, uh, took some action to um, delay some of the rules that the Trump administration were trying to put in that were um, really strictly regulating the H-1B visa category, which is professional work visas. So that is a big category for a lot of companies that use um, professional workers, a lot of the engineering jobs, the computer jobs, um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math jobs um, fall under that visa category. Um, and Trump really had it the Trump administration really had it out for that category and they were doing a lot of regulating. So um, we've kind of noticed that Biden might not be as um, willing to do away with all of that as, as we had hoped, but at least he's delaying for review some of those regulations that were um, about to kick in. So some of the things that has been going on, but it's overall been, been pretty positive. Um, there's been a few things with the with the bands that people don't love, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so, you know, I kind of went over all this already, but these are the kind of the key parts of the Biden immigration plan. Um, we're really excited, at least in our office, you know, to see family-based immigration reform, employment-based immigration reform, those are all things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, but then other things that I, not so much I deal with, but, um, you know, reforming the courts, I, CBP, immigration courts, um, restoring protections for asylum seekers and refugees. Um, the Trump administration was doing some pretty um, strict uh, and, and, and really kind of restrictionist policies for asylum seekers and refugees. One of the things like the Remain in Mexico policy where, where um, people seeking asylum had to stay in Mexico for their cases to be adjudicated, that um, has been done away with as well. So a lot of interesting things, um, more to come, obviously, it's just kind of the beginning, we're still in that first 100 days. Some of it is easy, executive orders, those are easy to, to get rid of. Um, but a lot of it, not so easy to get rid of. Some things is going to take legislation um, because we have such a narrow margin in the Senate um, or no margin, I guess. I mean, it's pretty much like tied, you know, in the Senate. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a task to get the, the bills passed, the laws passed. So we'll see what happens. But overall, just a more positive um, feeling. One of the points was like that Mayorkas was confirmed as the head of DHS. Mayorkas is, you know, more pro-immigrant. He's an immigrant himself, you know, so he, um, everyone felt pretty good about that choice and, and what that meant for the direction um, that this administration was going to go on immigration. So let's move. So got lots more things to talk about. Um, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on immigration. Um, and part of not everything, right? There's been a lot of, there were a lot of other things too. I actually did a whole like almost two hour presentation just on basically what you see on this slide. So we're going to try to boil it down to like a few minutes. Um, but one of the major issues was, um, the bans that were placed on immigration by the Trump administration. Um, because of COVID-19, you know, depending on who you ask, some people probably think that that was, uh, the, the prior administration using COVID-19 as an excuse to put in, um, barriers to legal immigration. Um, but that, I guess that depends on who you ask. In my opinion, I think a lot of this uh, could have been avoided if they would have just um, implemented the testing requirement that the Biden administration has implemented um, for 
for all international travelers. They would have just done something like that sooner. Um, we might not have had to have all of these bans and it probably would have been more effective. But what the Trump administration did was um, first they had an immigrant visa ban. So actually I'm gonna skip ahead and then I'll go back because I have a slide that just shows. This was basically the presidential proclamation on uh, in April for the immigrant visa ban where basically they banned entry of for stories um, of immigrants and issuance of immigrant visas. So immigrant visas, for those of you that aren't immigration lawyers, is permanent residence. Um, okay, so this ban specifically, um, which was Presidential Proclamation 114, was geared towards permanent immigrants, people looking to come here um, for permanent residency in the United States. This was a huge deal. Um, and restricting a lot of people from being able to come to the United States, people that already had, like for example, the diversity visa lottery winners that had to process by the end of the fiscal year, um, like all, a lot of those people lost their chances. There was you know, crazy lawsuits and everything about um, trying to get those people through before um, they basically lost their chance to immigrate. Um, based on their win of the diversity visa lottery. Um, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on. That ban um, ended by Biden revoking it on February 24th, 2021. So there was a lot of um, happiness around that. I think actually some of us were disappointed that it took that long. Uh, in my opinion, I thought he should have done that on day one um, when he signed the executive orders revoking the Muslim ban, you know, I was expecting to see um, the immigrant and also, in all honesty, the, the second one, which um, he didn't revoke at all, he just let it expire, the non-immigrant visa ban, um, I was expecting them to go away a lot faster. So I actually was a little disappointed um, in the way the administration handled that, but at least it finally happened, even if it, it took longer than it should have, in my opinion. Um, so we had February 24th, the immigrant visa ban went away. And then the NIV ban, which means non-immigrant visa, which you see here on your screen, uh, this one in, um, in, in June, basically, and restricted issuance of new um, H-1B, which are professional work visas, uh, J visas, which are um, interns, trainees, uh, camp counselors, au pairs, summer work travel, um, not all categories of J1s, but, but some of them are the ones you see there. L visa, which is intercompany transfers. A lot of multinationals um, use these to transfer their executives and managers um, between their foreign and U.S. entities. So um, restriction on issuance of, of these visas. Um, that one yesterday expired of its own kind of volition and had been extended by Trump. Um, we expected Biden to, to affirmatively revoke it. He did not. Um, instead, he let it expire on its own and that happened yesterday. So, you know, we all celebrated, all of us, myself included, um, were, you know, this should have happened sooner, but I guess we're happy that it happened when it did. Um, so those bands are gone. So I'm not gonna like waste time talking too much more about them since they are both gone, but what is still in place um, are the travel or country related COVID um, health related bans, like how to refer to them. We, I've heard them referred to by all of those names, but basically what the bans that are still in existence, um, which Trump also instituted and then Biden, um, instead of doing away with them, um, extended and also then added an extra country. He added South Africa, which um, Trump did not have on the banned country list. Um, but basically it affects foreign not physically present in the 14 days immediately prior to trying to enter the United States um, from Brazil, China, Iran, and, and the UK, the Schengen area, which encompasses pretty much most of uh, Western Europe and South Africa, which was added by Biden. Um, this is not done on the 
the nationals of those countries. This is a ban on anyone or well, any foreign national that was physically present in one of those countries in the 14 days immediately prior to trying to enter the United States. So you could be, you know, a foreign national from another country that is, you know, lives maybe in Spain, which is a Schengen country, um, but maybe you're Colombian, but you live in Spain. So it's not based on your nationality. You would still be subject to that Schengen ban. Um, if you travel to, if you already have a visa that is valid, you could travel, for example, to a non-banned country, quarantine for two weeks, and then travel into the United States, which is what a lot of our clients have had to do. Um, also, it doesn't apply to certain categories of people, um, mostly U.S. persons, U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, and there were some other exempt categories for like relatives of U.S. And lawful permanent residents. Um, but, you know, other applicants that basically are subject would not be able to come directly into the United States. And if they didn't have a visa already, they weren't able to get their visas because they're subject to one of these bans. And then prior to, you know, basically yesterday, they were probably also not in all cases, maybe also subject to one of the immigration bans, the non-immigrant or the immigrant visa ban. So that kind of just complicated everything. It was making it super hard for people to, to get here, to get their visas and, and get here. Um, there is national interest exemptions for the country related bans. So we'll talk about that in one second. But let me just also mention that, you know, on top of all these bans and, and crazy restrictions that we were trying to you know, figure out how our clients fit in and then the interplay between the three bands, um, which is now down to one, thank goodness. Um, on top of that, the embassies and consulates abroad worldwide have pretty much, sh pretty much shut down in March of last year um, and then started to reopen over the summer, but in a very kind of slow way, right? And in a, in a very, not just slow way, but that a very varied way. There's a tongue twister for you. Every country different, right? So some countries just not re reopening for routine visa processing at all. Others reopening for only certain types of visas. Others reopening for, you know, only emergency um, appointments. Um, others opening and then reversing and closing again when the situations got bad with COVID or they saw spikes in COVID. Um, maybe they had to retract some of their um, opening, reopening process. So it's been crazy trying to keep up with all of that. Um, luckily, again, the American immigration lawyers have you know, trying to maintain immigration from all the different posts. There are some interesting like spreadsheets that um, are live. So they're like being updated live and you can kind of click into it and, and see where the situation is or what, what my office usually does is just contacts the post directly um, with the consulate embassy we're, we're looking at um, and just checks it every time we were what the current state of that um, consulate or embassy is. So needless to say, it's been crazy and changing basically on like a daily basis, right? So this is the country ban. Here's the list. Um, I basically just told you all of that. Um, South Africa was outed by Biden and in January, and then additionally, Biden, um, a couple of days after um, he went into office, instituted a requirement for a negative COVID test um, within three days of attempting to enter the United States. And that applies to all international travelers, including U.S. citizens traveled abroad and then are returning to the United States. So everybody has to present now upon entry into the US, the negative COVID test that was taken within three days. Um, so what I was hoping was basically that when he instituted the testing requirement, he would do away with um, all three of the bans, the, the country bans and the immigrant, non-immigrant visa bans, because, you know, common sentiment among immigration lawyers, but also among a lot of health experts is that you don't need both. Like if you have the testing requirement, you don't have to have those other those other bands, especially the country ban, because that one is not, 
you know, the immigrant and the non-immigrant visa bans were really like Trump saying, oh, we're going to restrict these because we have such high unemployment right now in the U.S. because so many people have been laid off because of COVID and our unemployment levels are, you know, at all time highs. And so that's why we're going to restrict these immigrants and non-immigrants. That was, you know, what Trump used as the reasoning for those bans. Whereas the country related bans were more just like to limit the spread of COVID. So at that point, once you're instituting the testing requirement, it seems kind of silly to keep the country bans, but uh, they're still there. Um, and I just saw an article the other day that said something like Biden implies that bans are going to last a few more months still. So I think we're, we're still going to see these bans um, stretching throughout the spring and maybe into the summer. Um, hopefully, as more people start to get vaccinated, you know, we won't we'll be able to kind of do away with some of those bans. I know that the Biden administration wants to look like they're being very um, tough on, but like very strict with fighting COVID and, and that's like their main priority. So that's probably the reason why they left the bans in place. Um, I think the optics of it, you know, is playing a lot into that. So the country related bans, these are the people that are um, exempt from the bans. So U.S. citizen. So, for example, my brother lives in Italy, which is a Schengen country. He's a U.S. citizen, but he lives in Italy. And he was like, I can't come. And I'm like, yeah, you can. You can come. You're exempt from from the ban. You know, you would just have to basically get the negative COVID test. But before the testing requirement went in, I mean, I was just like, you can come. You, there's no problem with it. You're not subject to that ban. Um, but, you know. Most immigration attorneys are dealing with foreign nationals that don't fall into one of these bans categories. Um, so, I mean, one of these exempt categories. So we were dealing with um, them being subject to the ban. Deirdre, um, Barbara just asked a question in the chat. She just said, France yeah, and Italy France are experiencing Italy. surges. Why are they not on the list? They are. France Schengen and Italy. area encompasses fairly. Um, it's most of Europe. So wait, hold on. Here we go. So here you have the list, China, Iran, and then here's Schengen area. So as you can see, it's like most of, it's most of Europe. Um, and then we have UK, Ireland, Brazil, and then South Africa, which was when the South African variant, um, kind of came out and everyone was kind of freaking out about the South African variant and they weren't sure if the vaccines were going to be um, useful against that variant. And so they added South Africa also to the list. So yeah, Italy and Spain and um, all those European countries you see there are, are included. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I told you this already that basically it's not nationals of those countries, but people who are physically present in those countries. But um, another thing to keep in mind is that it also applies if you're transiting through a U.S. airport, even if you're not going to stay in the U.S., but you're just transiting through. And also, if you transited through a country that has the um, ban, but you didn't actually stay there, it's going to count as physical presence in one of the ban's countries. So being really careful with your travel itinerary to make sure, for example, that you're not going through a banned country, even if you're just in the airport, because that's going to subject you to the ban if you were subject to it otherwise. Uh, there are some national interest exemptions, um, specifically for the Schengen area, UK and Ireland um, from these bans. And originally we had uh, the people you see listed on this screen included in the national interest, but um, for some reason, the Secretary of State um, on March 2nd rescinded uh, these groups from being able to take advantage of the national interest exemption. So no longer including um, the, the categories you see here. A lot of um, us were disappointed because we have a lot of treaty traders and investors and senior level managers and executives as and technical experts and specialists as clients uh, that were able to take advantage of a national interest exemption. And as of um, March 2nd, they were no longer able to do that. Um, I would say if you have um, clients in these situations, there was a really good um, cable that came out from, I think it's Germany, uh, the US Embassy in Germany, 
um, that really goes in depth into this topic of the national interest exemptions for Schengen area. So that just came out, I think, at the beginning of March. So it's really um, a good resource if you're if you're dealing with this situation. Um, they do have national interest exemptions for what we consider critical infrastructure jobs. Um, and so this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some things that could be considered uh, critical infrastructure. So interesting. Um, if you have clients that work in these areas, you're probably going to be successful in getting them an, a national interest exemption and having them being able to enter even if and so what that means is basically if they can show that their entries in the national interest, then they would be exempt from the ban, even if they would otherwise be subject to it. Typically, um, also students um, are going to be exempt um, and some journalists and other people that work in public health, national security, and then some humanitarian considerations for, for exemptions. All right, I'm gonna skip ahead because we're running low on time already. Um, Mexico and Canada, they have had since March of last year, basically, uh, land border entry restrictions. So if you're plane, not so much, but if you're traveling by land, um, limited to essential travel, um, they would, those were just extended, uh, those, um, essential travel restriction, um, on entry through the land borders of Mexico and Canada were just extended through April 21st. They've been extended repeatedly basically for the past year. Um, so we're not sure when we're going to see those um, come to an end. But basically, essential travel um, does not include traveling for tourism purposes. So I would say if you are traveling for tourism purposes, make sure you go on an airplane. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds, um, and not on a land border. Um, so additionally, for, for some of us that travel and for our US citizen clients, you know, um, and clientele that's in the United States looking to travel outside, there's, you know, the additional consideration of, okay, are you going to be allowed to go into the country that you're trying to go into? Um, and because we're not the only country that has all these travel bans, um, many other countries have instituted similar bans um, or their own version of a testing requirement or some kind of um, limitation on entry. So again, you know, something we've been dealing with as immigration lawyers is becoming like almost not travel agents, but like travel concierge advisors because people are, need to understand like, can they go to the place where they're going and then can they come back after that? So we have to be really careful um, and advising our clients to basically tell us every time that they're gonna travel. And um, this map that I put the link is awesome because it's an interactive map of the world where you click and it shows you like a basic rundown of whatever country you hover over's um, current travel um, and entry restriction. So, you know, don't take it as gospel, but, and, and definitely like, if you see something, you might then want to look at like an official page from that, from that country's, um, you know, state department or whatever, but um, it's a good place to start at least to see, you know, what's going on in the various countries. Um, interesting resource. Okay. I'm actually going to skip through this because I think that we just don't have time. All right. Let's skip to the next topic. Uh, something interesting for the Floridians, um, maybe not so interesting for the rest of you, unless you have similar things that might happen in your state. Um, beginning on January 1st, 2021, in the state of Florida, every public employer, contractor, and subcontractor um, must enroll in and use E-Verify to confirm the eligibility of all new employees. So E-Verify is an electronic system, for those of you don't, that don't know, that the employer enrolls in E-Verify and then they run their employees through the system to see if they're um, eligible to work in the United States. It, in addition to an I-9, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, I-9s are the forms that every single US employer who has any employees in their company uses to verify whether that employee is um, number one who they say they are so verify their identity 
to verify um, if they're authorized to work in the United States. Um, any of you that work in the US um, as a W-2 employee probably filled out one of those forms within the first three days that you started working. Um, and then E-Verify is kind of like an additional system, which, um, you know, varying states have tried to make mandatory. We don't have national mandatory E-Verify, whereas the I-9 is mandatory for all employers um, in the, in, across the United States. Um, but this has been an interesting thing because the governor of Florida has been like really gung-ho on, on doing mandatory E-Verify. And it was kind of like something that he's been talking about since, you know, the time that he was campaigning for governor um, before he even took office. So um, finally, he made kind of like a version of that happen. I mean, luckily, it doesn't affect all employers. It only affects, you know, some employers, public employers, um, contractors and subcontractors, um, subcontractors working with public contracts have to provide the contractor with an affidavit that has to be retained by the contractor um, for the entire duration, stating that they don't employ, um, contract with, or subcontract any unauthorized aliens. And contractors need to go through this process for every public project that they work on. Um, the private employers, on the other hand, are not required to use the E-Verify unless they have a contract with a public employer um, or they're applying for taxpayer funded incentives through our state um, Department of Economic Opportunity. Uh, additionally, though, and for every employer, but you know, we're talking specifically about Florida, but for everyone, um, they have to do the I-9 form that I just told you guys about. Um, and basically this law also added some um, additional rules for I-9s um, onto the Florida employers. So it's, I'm going to kind of skip through this, but very interesting if you're in Florida and you have clients um, that work um, in this area, you know, public contracts, public employers, um, subcontractors that are dealing with public contracts, very interesting to make sure that your clients are in compliance um, and that they're using E-Verify, that they understand how to use E-Verify correctly, and then also that they're still maintaining um, their, their I-9s correctly. So on the topic of I-9s, let's kind of shift into, into that a little bit. Um, like I said, it's verifying the identity and the employment authorization of your employees as an employer. Um, and you're supposed to typically inspect the person's documents in person. Um, there's like a list that you give the, the new employee of documents that are acceptable um, to buy either both the employment authorization and the identity in one document. That's what we call a list A document. Or um, you can have kind of one from the other two lists, like one each. One is an identity document and one is a, a document that shows that you're authorized to work in the United States. And you can like do two documents that combined prove both things. So you either do like the one document that serves both purposes or you do one of each for um, the other two and the employer would have to inspect those documents. So then when COVID came along and everyone started working remote, people were like, how are we going to do this? Um, you know, what are we going to do? So basically um, the DHS and ICE basically announced flexibilities, uh, you know, back when all this started last March. Um, and then they've continuously extended them. We kept wondering like, when is this gonna end? Um, when are these new flexibilities gonna end? Because they're, they're, they're really convenient for um, companies that are working entirely remotely. They allow for the company to verify the documents um, electronically, which is typically not allowed. So it's been really convenient for employers. So we've just kind of been like waiting for the shoe to drop, but they've extended it yet again. Um, yesterday, they announced an additional extension. Um, this is going to go through May 31st. Um, so, you know, we have at least a few more months uh, where we can take advantage of these flexibilities. Um, and so basically what it allows for is um, remote over video link, fax, email, et cetera, um, you know, Zoom, 
FaceTime, you know, any kind of video, um, email, fax, inspection of the documents. And then basically the employer would write in like a COVID-19 and then once um, normal operations in person resume, they're required to actually physically inspect those documents and then update the paperwork. The thing that I think is really important to remember for these is that it's only for employers who workplaces are operating remotely. So if you have kind of like the hybrid thing going on, which as the pandemic is progressing, we have a lot of hybrid where it's like some people are remote and some people are um, in the office. I mean, I'm, my my firm is a perfect example. I'm, this is my home office. I mean, I'm sitting in my house right now, but my assistant is at my office right now. So we're hybrid. So um, we have most of the team working remote and then we have one person working in the office, but that one person means that I'm not operating entirely remotely. So when I um, onboard a new junior paralegal, which I'm hoping to do soon. So if anyone knows of a junior paralegal in Miami that wants a job, tell them to hit me up. Um, you know, I'm going to have to have the, the documents inspected in a particular way um, in person. And I, I so it's really important to understand that not everyone that is working remotely in some capacity, not all businesses that are working remotely in some capacity can take advantage of these flexibilities. Um, other flexibilities which have been interesting, E-Verify, you know, giving people extra time when the E-Verify shoots back a mismatch. Um, so what happens is a lot of times the, it will check the social security and it will um, say that it doesn't match the, the or the picture doesn't match or some, some kind of um, non-confirmation of the employee's information. Um, they were given time to, to resolve those. Um, basically, you know, they're saying that there's, uh, you're supposed to give extra time and not take any um, kind of retaliatory or negative uh, action against the employee uh, while they're trying to resolve these cases, especially given the fact that a lot of the social security and DHS offices um, were closed. You know, a lot of that is starting to end. So we'll see how much longer these folks for E-Verify are in place. Um, okay, skipping ahead because we're gonna run out of time. Oh, so this just happened. So the H-1Bs, for those of you that aren't immigration lawyers, is the professional work visa um, for workers in a specialty occupation at a US company. Um, and they have a quota. So this is a visa that is capped out at um, 65,000 um, with then an additional 20,000 for applicants with US master's degrees. So master's degrees from US um, patients. So 85,000 if you add those two together. Um, and typically we get, you know, maybe three times that in the amount of people applying for the for those slots of visas. Um, so what they started doing, God, years ago was running a lottery, but the way they used to run the lottery was that, um, you would just mail your submissions in, in the first, you know, five days of April, which April is six months before the fiscal year starts because the visa allocation runs by fiscal year. October 1st, what six months before October 1st, April 1st. So that's how they came up with kind of like the April 1st date, um, which is today, coincidentally. Um, so what we used to do is just in the first five days of April, we would have to prepare and submit all of our cases and then kind of like wait and see if they were chosen. If we got like the skinny envelope back, we'd all be happy because it was a risk, meaning that um, our case was accepted for processing. If we got the fat envelope back, we were sad because it meant that they were um, rejecting our, our case because it didn't get chosen in the lottery. And they don't even look at it. They don't even look at the merits of your case. Like you didn't get picked. Here's your paperwork back. Um, try again next year type of thing. So one thing that the Trump administration did that I actually kind of liked, which um, I think this might be the only thing um, in terms of immigration, was instituting an electronic lottery last year um, and that we did continue that process this year um, where all the employer had to do to get into the lottery was an electronic registration in a certain time frame, last year, I think it was March 1st to 20th this year, it was the 9th to the 25th, um, so it just happened, 
where you register for the lottery online, a short application, a small fee, $10. Um, and then that's how they ran the lottery. And uh, by the way, much faster when everything is electronic to run the lottery. They've already, five days it took them, run the lottery and notified all of the people that were selected where it used to take a long time and it would like trickle, you know, you'd get the, the responses trickling in by mail. Um, so we were all kind of like waiting around with bated breath for like months to see. Uh, this time much faster. We know whether they got chosen or not right away. It's all electronic notification. Um, and then you get two months to submit the full case. So maybe that's why a lot of the immigration lawyers aren't here today because they're already on the people who have been selected on their H-1Bs. Um, we have from April 1st, today is the first day you're allowed to send those cases in and until June 30th as the window. Um, so lots of work to do on our selected cases in the next um, couple of months. Something that is interesting is that a lot, bunch of us in the INVLF and also in a lot of the other immigration related groups that I'm in have been talking that uh, we're, we saw a lot lower selection rate this year of our like total amount that we submitted. Um, I think the, the, the folks from INVLF immigration group were saying they were seeing between about 20 to 25 percent of the registrations they submitted getting selected. And that tracks for me with the other groups that I've um, that I'm in that um, have been talking. Everyone's saying about 20 to 25 percent chosen, which is a little bit lower than usual. So that's a little bit frustrating. Not sure what the reason is. We'll see how this plays out. Okay, we're almost done, you guys. Um, I've got, I think, five more slides um, and I think two more topics. One of them that I was asked to include in this presentation is about understanding the export control compliance as it relates to immigration petitions. Um, so not a new topic. It's been around for, you know, almost 10 years or so. This kind of came up in December um, 2010 where companies sponsoring foreign nationals in certain categories, um, H-1B, H-1B1, L-1, and O-1A, um, basically on the petition that you submit with in order to apply for one of these categories, um, you have to answer questions um, certifying basically whether the foreign nationals, um, whether you're complying with the Export Administration regulations and the international traffic and arms regulations and really creating an affirmative obligation on those employers to um, access their technology and technical data that is that would be subject to those requirements and whether a license is required by the foreign people um, that you're applying for in these um, H1B, H1B1, L1 and O1A petitions. Um, so as you see here, covers basically all, almost all exports of technical data and technology from the United States are subject to these regulations, uh, software, computers, semiconductors, medical devices. Um, you can find uh, what's regulated by the EAR on the commerce control list. Um, and then the um, is more defense related items, but also a lot of technology um, and you can find those on the U.S. munitions list. So this is what it looks like on the form, I actually cut and pasted the form. And you can see it's a simple attestation, basically, like yes or no, a license is not required or a license is required. But, you know, when answering those questions, you really have to be able to identify the control technology and, and technical data that, um, you know, the job that you're offering the for requires, um, whether they're going to be permitted access to controlled technology or controlled technical data, um, and disclosing this. And basically, if you get audited on this, you better make sure that you have evidence that um, it's not so, if you check that it's not required. So, yeah, all right, well, we'll since, ask you since, I, since yeah. I was the guy who asked you that question, can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to answer it, but yeah, well, this is a I mean, weird, we, we, a very technical topic. We do the the export control side of this. We help people identify what is licensable. 
what I don't understand on your side is what the consequences are. So you said if you get audited, you got to be careful, but so or so be careful so you can pass an audit. But what's the consequence of a false certification for the employer? Um, that's a really good question. First of all, you know, giving false information under penalty of perjury on a federal form, sure. but I would think that there would be fines involved. I don't actually know what the penalty is. So there on that. There are penalties, there's pretty severe penalties on the Commerce Department and State Department side because you've it would mean you have illegally exported that data. So the yeah. Commerce Department side <laughs> yeah. would would have a violation. What I wasn't sure about is whether there was a separate agency immigration, immigration side. Like, yeah, if there's any kind of a fine or penalty. I'm sure that there is, but honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I can find out for you. Yeah, I'm just, I would just so, be curious. I, I actually... I actually don't have, I don't think any clients that have checked um, yes on this. So it is a subject that I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe I need to be more, you know, you know, give a better explanation to my clients what they're, you know, what they're actually attesting to here. Because, yeah, I mean, like you said, on the commerce side, there's huge um, consequences. So and on the immigration side, you know, I would think it would be more just like a fraud, fraudulent, mm -hmm. you know, attestation. Um, but I don't know for sure uh, okay. what the exact answer to that question is. So I'm happy to look into it for you. Well, um, and, I'm, and let you I'm know. I'm happy to help on the other side. that is a topic that I, yeah. 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 Okay. So just to wrap it up, you guys, um, I know we're at the time. Um, I just wanted to talk about a few other little things that are like hot news in the immigration world. Um, one of them I already mentioned, which is the temporary protected status for Venezuela. Um, this designation is going to go through um, September 9th, 2022. So people that basically have been continuously in the United States since March 8th, which was the day they announced it, um, basically they can apply for this temporary protected status, which also they can apply for a work permit and an advanced parole, which is a travel um, permit. And they have to register though for the TPS protections between these dates, March 9th and September 5th. It's basically an 180 day period to register. Um, and then basically the protection is gonna go through the end of, or the beginning of September of 2022. Um, and then we'll see if it gets extended. If it gets extended, then basically that protection will, will last longer. But the thing is that we don't know um, until the time comes whether the protections are going to be extended or not. But this has been really um, exciting for a lot of people in South Florida. Can yeah. I ask you a question on the um, temporary protected yes. status? Yeah. Uh, what, what about people who are coming in from other countries uh, like the Philippines? They've been here for 20, 20 years. They've been paying their taxes. They've been um, complying with all, all of the regulations and the rules and the laws that American citizens are complying with, yet they're out of status. I, I won't use the word illegal alien, but they're out of status. Uh, they came here legally, perhaps on a tourist visa. Is there any relief for mm -hmm. them with TPS or not? Not if they're not from a designated country. And I assume so that if they if their country is not designated, then they can't go. They can't get TPS through it. Um, you have to be an actual citizen of one of those countries, or um, some some. Um, I think there's an exception for like stateless people, but that were firmly resettled in the in the country that's been designated. But for people who are like citizens of other countries, with like a the Philippines, for example, like if they don't have the designation, then there's no protection under TPS. Where is TPS that? TPS is by country. Um, it's on the USCIS website. So if you're interested, I can send that to you, Barbara. Um, I'd be happy to, to share that information with you. Email. Yeah, please put your information in the chat. And also I'm sure Annabelle can, can share it with me. Um, but, but I'd be happy to share that information with you, but, but 
it has to be the country that's designated. So that's why, for example, this was a big deal because a lot of people were thinking that that Trump, because Trump was always talking about, oh, you know, I'm a friend of the Venezuelans and whatever, You're like always talking that line, but never actually took the steps to do something that would help the people of that community that are already in the United States. So it was interesting to see that that was one of the first things that, that the Biden administration did. Um, another thing that's been really interesting for us in the immigration world is the public charge rule, which basically the Trump administration put in a rule saying that, that, that basically most immigrants and a lot of non-immigrants as well had to prove um, basically that they were rich enough to, to come to the United States. Um, this rule has been the subject of a lot of court battles and a lot of um, arguing and litigation over the past several years. And finally, we think that it's dead for good, we hope. Um, this administration basically has indicated that they are not going to um, continue with this rule. And they just recently removed the requirements um, off of the website. They removed the form that was needed to, to show that you weren't going to be a public charge. They've um, revised the other forms that, that included kind of the attestations and the thing, the information that you had to, to um, prove that you weren't going to be a public charge. They removed uh, that information from the forms and, and republished new forms. So we are finally seeing this um, public charge kind of debacle go away. Um, it's been a big fight uh, over this. So it's it's been interesting to watch it play out and then finally um, kind of die on the vine. Um, another interesting thing, and I think this is it. Uh, I think this is the last slide. Um, we actually got a lot of extra time. This was one good thing that, that immigration did even during the Trump administration um, in response to COVID. Um, so this is COVID related, this slide um, specifically, is that they gave us a lot of extra time to answer um, requests for additional evidence, notices of intent to deny, notices of intent to revoke cases, um, other, other notices that you see here that require a response within a certain time frame. They basically said, if you got one of these notices between March 1st of last year, and now they've extended the date to June 30th, 2021, that date has, has been changed as they've extended it, right? So they've extended it a bunch of times. Um, this latest extension they published on the 24th of March, um, and it goes through June 30th. We got an extra 60 days to respond um, to, to one of these notices. So that's been really useful um, for a lot of clients and their attorneys. Um, and, and just other little things like the ability to use a, a photocopy or scanned signature that on forms that maybe we couldn't do before that required like a wet ink signature. Now we could do a scanned copy. Um, little things like that have been really helpful in um, working the, the COVID kind of life where, you know, everything was closed and remote. Um, so small blessings, I guess, um, have, come out, uh, have come out of this. Um, so that's it for me. I know I went over time, so I apologize for that. And I appreciate you guys sticking it out.